All right, and welcome to Chapter 7, Routing Dynamically. All right, you know, way back in the day, um, we did classful routing. So we, we routed by classful IP addresses. You could only have an A, B, or C, that kind of thing. And then RIP um, routing protocol was introduced. So, you know, routing internet protocol or routing internet, internet networking protocol, however you want to say it. So RIP was introduced. And then after RIP, um, Cisco came up with um, IGRP, Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, and that really caught on. And then later on, you know, they um, made it better, but they called it Enhanced Interior Routing Gateway Protocol. Um, and then OSPF came out. So there's all these different routing protocols that we use. But the purpose of the routing calls, or routing protocols, dynamic routing protocols, is to have our routers talk to each other and, and automatically update themselves. So if a network goes down, they'll talk to each other and let each other know. If a network comes up, they'll let each other know. That kind of thing. So that way, if a link goes down, they can find the best path, the best backup path, on their own. So the majority of networks use some type of dynamic routing protocol, made up of three things. Um, you have some kind of database structure um, where the information is kept. Uh, is it kept in RAM? Is it kept in a flash? Something like that. Then they have messages. They all talk to each other some way, whether it's just hello messages or something like that. And then they all have an algorithm. They all have a method to compute the best route given the information that they collect uh, with, via their messages. So make sure you understand how all these three things work for each of the routing protocols that we talk about. You know, where's the information stored, what information stored, what messages do they send, and how are their routes calculated. So here first we'll talk about EIGRP. So as using as an example, so EIGRP creates a neighbor table and a topology table. Uh, and those are stored in the running config. So you have to save that to the uh, startup config, uh, otherwise when you reboot it's all gone. And then he has five different types of messages, hellos, updates, queries, replies, acknowledgments. So basically um, they send hellos to kind of keep each other uh, appraised that, that they're still working. Um, they send an update message when something changes, um, and then when somebody gets an update that he doesn't have the information on, then he'll send a query, then a reply will come back, and then we acknowledge and that kind of thing. And then the algorithm with EIGRP, um, it takes it can take several different factors in, um, but the big ones are bandwidth and delay. So really, EIGRP looks at the bandwidth of the links and then selects a link really based on bandwidth. So advantages um, of dynamic routing protocols. Dynamic routing protocols automatically share information. They automatically update themselves if a path goes down. They automatically add new networks that come around. Um, they help the network administrator to manage his time because it does a lot of these things automatically um, and we don't have to manage static routes. The bad thing is, um, or the, the disadvantage is, obviously they suck more CPU and bandwidth. You know, when we're sending hello messages and we're sending um, our routing table every 30 seconds, things like that, you know, it takes up some bandwidth. Um, when new networks come in and, and uh, calculations have to be changed, um, it sucks up CPU time. So with a very small network, or even a network of what we only have one router, uh, there's obviously no need to use a dynamic routing protocol. Um, you know, a default static route can handle all your needs. But we still use static routing here and there. Um, we still use static routing in stub networks, um, when you only have one router, uh, things like that. So again, static routing is not going away. Um, it's just not used very often. So in this case here, you know, R1, his only place where he can send things to are dot ten, dot eleven, or R2. So his routing table would say, you know, I have a path for, you know, dot ten, I have a path for dot eleven. Um, but in that case you can do a default static route that sends everything to R2 because everything else is on R2. So that way if PC1 talks to PC2 and he gets a packet for 11, he forwards it to the 11 because remember these two would still be in the routing proto or the routing table. They would still be, you know, at the top of the routing table because they're directly connected. And then the default route would be at the bottom. So these two could still talk to each other and then the default route would catch everything else and then send it over to R2, then R2 could route it from there. So even in um I guess somewhat, you know, not not just 
very tiny networks, um, but even when your network gets a little bit bigger, um, there are still cases where static routes are used. So dynamic routing protocols, um, advantages, obviously they're suitable in all topologies. Um, they typically scale well, um, allow to grow. Um, they adapt uh, when you change the network. Uh, but they can be complex to implement. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do with the EIGRP or OSPF. Um, they're less secure, obviously, if somebody gets a hold of uh, one of your routers or they can connect to your physical network um, and they can see routing updates, they can kind of build a map of your, your current network. And they require, obviously, CPU and, and bandwidth. All right, so now we're going to talk about an example. Um, first, on a cold start, so we, we boot up all three routers. So when the routers boot up, you know, this router here only knows about these two directly connected networks. This router only knows about these two directly connected networks. This router only knows about directly connected networks. So each router, when it boots up, only knows about directly connected routers. Now in this example, we're going to say that, that RIP version 2 is on these routers. Now, first thing that happens, you know, R1 sends his update to R2, R3 sends his update to R2, and R2 sends his updates out to R1 and R3. So when R2 sends his update, he knew about this route here, the 2 route, and he knew about the dot .3 route, so he sent those to R1. Well, R2 or R1 already knew about the dot .2 route, so he adds the dot .3 route to his network. And then when he sends you know, R2 and R3 to R3, R3 knew about 3 and 4 because he's directly connected to those two, but he didn't know about 2, so he adds those to our, his network. Now when R2 received the packets from R1 and R3, he did not know about the, the dot .1 network or the dot .4, so he adds those. So now he knows about 1, 2, 3, 4 networks, the other two only know about 3 networks. So this slide just kind of explains what I already talked about, so now they're talking about R2, then they're going to talk about what happened at R3, and now we're going to talk about the next step. So after R1 sent this packet to R2 and R2 sent this packet to R1, so the first step was completed, then R2 changes his information, then he sends another update to R2, and R2 sends another update to R1. But this time in the second message, R2 has received a message from R3 from the first message, and now he knows about 4. So he sends the information for dot .4 over to R1, so R1 adds that to his network. So at this point, the routers all know about all the networks in this. So it took two periods or two messages to make that happen. So during the first message, let's say the message happens every 30 seconds. So after the first 30 seconds, the tables look like this. You know, they, they knew about the remotes from each other after the first message cycle. Then after the second message cycle, uh, they knew about the entire network. So in this case, it took two cycles or 60 seconds for the routers to converge, um, for them to know all the information that was available. So when we talk about convergence, what we're saying is the time it takes for your routers to completely update themselves um, on what has happened. And some routing protocols are slower and some are faster than others. So generally, like RIP, RIP sends updates every 30 seconds. So the routing cycle is every 30 seconds. So if you've got three cycles needed, it would take a minute and a half for, to achieve convergence. Where EIGRP um, sends hello messages every five seconds. So every five seconds you kind of have a cycle where they're, they're passing information back and forth and they're learning about new information. So obviously EIGRP would converge much faster than RIP. Um, OSPF as well. So OSPF and EIGRP converge very fast when you compared to RIP. RIP is the slowest to converge. So you don't typically see RIP in any networks out there. Almost every network that I've seen in the last 10 years is EIGRP or OSPF. So don't forget the word convergence. Convergence means all routers have received their updates and they're all operating normally. They don't need any other updates. So they're all sharing their, their routing tables are all um, have the information that they need to route. All right, your routing protocols come in two flavors, interior gateway and exterior gateway. Interior gateway typically means interior to a, uh, a company or a building, something like that. Exterior means the internet. So in this case here, um, the internet uses BGP, um, and that's how it routes. If the internet had to use something like EIGRP or OSPF um, exclusively, the routing tables would be huge, um, and we would have all kinds of issues. Um, but we'll get into BGP later on in another class. So we're going to focus on interior gateway routing protocols, the routing protocols we use inside a company. 
So when you get into interior gateway routing protocols, then you've got two choices, distance vector or link state. Now, we don't really do ISIS anymore. We don't talk about that in the, uh, the Cisco program. Um, we only deal with these three, so RIP, EIGRP, and OSPF. Now, RIP and RIP version 1 and IGRP um, were the early models. They were classful. Um, nobody supports those anymore. So we typically don't deal with those. Um, we deal with RIP version 2, which allows us to do to do subnet masks or classless center domain routing, and then EIGRP, which is Cisco proprietary, so meaning you have to have all Cisco routers, and then OSPF, which is kind of which is a standards-based one, so all routers support that. So depending on which book you read, you know distance vector is always RIP, and OSPF is always link state. But EIGRP, some books say it's distance vector, some books say it's link state, other books will say it's a hybrid of the two. So just make sure that you understand there's interior and exterior gateway routing protocols. Interior are, you know, for like a company. And the three that we focus on in CCNA are RIP version 2, EIGRP, and OSPF. And you can see them used in different places. So here, um, they're running EIGRP and then they have their ISP. In this case, this ISP is running OSPF, this ISP is running ISIS, um, and then it goes through BGP through the internet. Um, remember, this might be their central office or something like that. Uh, and then go back to another building where they're running OSPF and RIP. Um, so you see a bunch of different routing protocols, and the routing protocols can all be um, transferred into each other, um, or they call that route redistribution, so that you can convert an OSPF network and, and transfer it, its information onto an EIGRP network. But again, that's outside the scope of the CCNA. Um, just make sure you understand, like, the way the Internet works, there are different networks out there, and different networks use different protocols. All right, with distance vector routing, typically they measure the distance. So each routing protocol knows there are other networks out there. They're three hops away, um, and I need, in order to get there, I send to here. So distance vector routing protocols know the next link in the chain. Um, they know other places are out there, so they know there's an end of the chain somewhere, but they don't know exactly where. But he, they know where to go to the next link. Then the next link knows to the next link, and that kind of thing, and that's how it actually gets there. So distance vector routing co protocols are like that. They know the distance and the direction to get somewhere to the next link in the chain, or the next hop. All right, so RIP version 1, RIP version 2, IGRP, and then EIGRP. Remember, RIP is open source or standards based, and then EIGRP and uh, IGRP were Cisco proprietary. Uh, remember, RIP version 1 is classful, IGRP classful. Um, we do not use those anymore, so we only focus on RIP version 2 and EIGRP. So another way of remembering what distance vector routing protocols are, they kind of work like signposts. So each sign points to the next destination. Um, you know, like when you're on a jogging path or something like that, and then you see a sign that says, oh, go left. Then the next sign says, oh, go right. So the signs like kind of point you to the final destination, but they each only show you like one step, the next step. So that's how distance vector routing protocols work. One knows, uh, router one knows, in order to get to the network um, on R4, I would send to R2. And then R2 knows in order to get to R4, I send to R3, and then R3 knows to get to R4, I send to R4, and that's kind of how it all works out. Now, link state are a little bit different. Link states um, typically have a table of all the links, so they know everything that's out there, and that way, if a link goes down, he knows all other links that are available, and he can kind of reroute around that. So they, they have a, like a complete topology map of the network. And the one that we focus on is OSPF. Remember, ISIS is, um, is typically in provider networks, um, so we don't see that inside companies. Um, so OSPF is the big standards-based one that we use. I remember classful routing protocols that only route to classful IP addresses, A, B, and C. They don't send subnet masks, um, so we don't use them anymore um, and have not used those in at least 15 years that I've been doing stuff. So we use classless routing protocols, RIP version 2, EIGRP, OSPF. Um, both or all, or all three of those support you know, IPv6, they support VOSM, um, and they support SITR. Now, RIP version 2 isn't an IPv6 routing protocol, um, but RIP NG is. OSPF version 2 doesn't support IPv6, but OSPF version 3 does. So they all have variations that support IPv6. So as far as your routing protocols go, um, you know, as far as remember, RIP converges very slow, EIGRP and OSPF converge very fast. 
Um, the scalability, how you can grow your network. You know, RIP, you can't grow your network very well. Uh, I think RIP, the, the, the biggest hop count you can have is 15. So you can only have 15 routers in your network, uh, where OSPF and EIGRP grow very large. Um, RIP doesn't support VLSM except for version 2, um, and that is obviously supported in EIGRP and OSPF. Um, but RIP doesn't suck up a whole lot of resources where EIGRP does a little bit and then OSPF does more. Remember, EIGRP is a distance vector, so he only calculates um, to the next hop, where OSPF calculates the entire network. Um, so each router has a map of the entire network, so that obviously sucks up a lot more uh, CPU cycles. Uh, and then maintenance, you know, RIP is obviously very easy to implement. Uh, there's only a few commands it supports, where EIG or OSPF are very complex. Um, you can actually like filter the, the, the messages and do a bunch of other stuff. Um, you can be very specific with it. Um, so um, it can take, it can be very complex to play with. All right, so how do routers calculate um, the best path? How do they do that? Well, we call that the metric. And the metric is, uh, you know, the, the method that they use to determine the cost. So each routing protocol has a different metric. Um, and when they use that metric, they calculate the, the routes, and then they pick the one that has the lowest cost. So with distance vector routing protocols, they've got some things in common. Um, they share updates between neighbors. Uh, they're not aware of the entire network topology. So they don't build an, a complete map of the entire network. Um, they send periodic broadcasts out, even if something hasn't changed. Now, again, this is kind of an overview because EIGRP doesn't do this. You know, RIP, if nothing changes, every 30 seconds he sends a, his routing table out. Boom. Which, again, is another reason why nobody uses RIP. But EIGRP sends out a hello message every 5 seconds. So even if there's no change, and that way EIGRP tells the other neighbor, hey, I'm still alive. So every five seconds he sends out a little hello message saying, hey, I'm still alive. Um, so they do send out periodic updates or some kind of message um, every so often. Uh, obviously, updates consume bandwidth, things like that. Um, EIGRP and OS and RIP version 2, they use a multicast address uh, to send their messages. Um, and then EIGRP will only send an actual update with all the updated information when something changes. But RIP sends information, uh, or the entire routing table, every 30 seconds. So again, nobody uses RIP. We all use EIGRP or OSPF. Both EIGRP and OSPF, only send, well, we, they only send hello packets, a very small packet to tell the other routers that they're still operational. So it, it doesn't really use a whole lot of bandwidth for that stuff. But then, if there's a change, they actually send out an update that has information to fix the change, that kind of thing. So back to algorithms, and I don't know why they, they put the metric here, and then they talk about something totally different, and then they go back to the metric. But uh, RIP uses um, the Bellman-Ford algorithm. And basically what RIP does is it says, hey, how many routers are between me and you? Now, way back in the early days when RIP was you know designing stuff, there wasn't a whole lot of variable, like, like different bandwidth out there. Um, it was all kind of like 1 or 10 megabits per second. So it didn't really matter. So RIP just cal calculates the number of routes between the path. So if I've got a path that goes through eight routers, but it's all fiber and super fast, then I have a path that goes through one router, but it's dial-up. RIP will always take the, the dial-up path because it has less routers between the uh, you know, point A and point B. So RIP only uses the number of routers. That's his method. So his algorithm will always be a number between 1 and 15 because it can only calculate 15 routers. After that, you know, uh, RIP is you can't you can't grow RIP beyond 15 routers. Where EIGRP um, and the older one IGRP use a method called the diffusing update algorithm, uh, which was developed by Cisco. And what it does is it takes bandwidth and delay. Um, so really, it look, bandwidth is the big factor as far as EIGRP goes. So in that same scenario, EIGRP would pick the fiber path because it would be faster than the dial-up path. 
All right, so some information on the routing protocols um, with with RIP. You know, RIP version one doesn't support crap. No VLSM, no sitter, no summarization, no authentication. Um, it's bad. Nobody uses RIP version one and has not for many many years. Um, RIP version two. Uh, sometimes you see it in test networks or something like that, or somebody slaps it on in in a small area um, to kind of kind of cover things until EIGRP or OSPF can be implemented. Something like that. Uh, but in most cases, you will not see RIP out there in the real world. All right, so then IGRP and EIGRP. Again, remember, IGRP was Cisco's first. Remember, you know, Cisco grew for a reason. They didn't become the size that they are because they, they, did, they just started that way. You know, Cisco came out with, you know, like ISL for uh, VLANs and IGRP for routing, and that was really their bread and butter that kind of led them, uh, or they led the the industry and then the industry then formed standards around those protocols so like Cisco had IGRP and then the standard organizations all got together and said hey we really like this um, we're gonna modify it and call it OSPF um, so then they make OSPF then the Cisco counters with making it in enhanced IGRP so remember the big three RIP EIGRP OSPF RIP open source uh, open standard nobody touches it anymore because it's kind of outdated uh, and then EIGRP Cisco proprietary and then OSPF um, open source or open standard all right so let's turn routing protocols on it's typically you go to global mode and then router space then whatever you're going to turn on so in this case router RIP so we turn on router RIP then you have to advertise the networks that that router is going to um, tell his neighbors about now these network statements get confusing and everybody always gets confused here because they think that if I say network 192.168.1.0 then that's what my router is going to advertise. That is not true. Your router then takes these network statements then he looks at his interfaces and says whatever interfaces I have that match these statements that's what I'm going to advertise. So in this case on router 1 he has 192.168.1 and he has 192.168.2 so I could do one network statement and do 192.168.0.0 and then he would say hey this network matches and this network matches so because these two networks match the network statement I'm going to advertise these two networks now we don't typically do that because obviously it, it kinda it makes things kinda ballooned up and then if I made other networks out there that I didn't want to advertise they would be included in the network statement things like that so we typically specify in the network statement uh, exactly the networks we want to but don't forget the network statement doesn't say hey it's not written in stone it doesn't say hey I'm only gonna advertise these networks it says any interface that matches the network statement I'm going to advertise the network of that interface so make sure you're clear there um, because again here I could use 192.168.0.0 and it would advertise 192.168.2 and 192.168.1 because they would both match 192.168.0.0 if that makes sense. Alright so after I turned on the routing protocols on all the routers so I go to all three routers you know router rip, router rip, router rip and then I advertise with the network statements they all start converging then if I want to check things I do show IP protocols so show IP protocols gives us a boatload of information uh, it tells us our timers um, hey you know when's the next update or what's my update timer set to what's the invalid timer the hold down timer flushed all that information what networks am I advertising so again the networks I'm advertising and then if you want to verify that then you go to show IP route and you hit begin gateway and get rid of the, the legend here um, but then you can see hey I'm getting these other networks from other routers and I'm learning routes through RIP so my router and another router must be communicating um, through RIP so that's how you'd verify now like I said we don't typically use RIP we use RIP version 2 if we're going to use it anywhere um, so to, to put RIP version 2 on there it's just router RIP enter and then version 2 enter and that's it um, and then again you do your network statements and you're all good alright some protocols depending on how your network is you can run into an issue with um, uh, auto summarization so basically most of these protocols will auto automatically summarize the networks which is okay as long as you don't have a discontiguous network meaning I got 192.168.1 on the left and then I have um, you know 172 in the middle and then I have another 192.168.5 on the right so I have 192.168 on both sides of the network so I can't summarize that kind of like the left side because that wouldn't work 
So we typically do no auto summary. So no auto summary will, will remove the auto summarization. Um, and then all the networks will be listed um, in their full text, which is typically what we want. All right, passive interfaces. You sometimes there are interfaces that typically go to the end users that there's no need to send routing updates or hello messages out of. So in this example, here's R1. He connects to a switch, and then the switch connects to 25 users or 24 users. There's nothing on this part of the network that needs a routing update. You know, the switch doesn't care whether he's still he's running EIGRP, and all the clients don't care whether he's running EIGRP. So there's no reason for R1 to send messages out Gigabit 00's interface. So when he goes into router rip, he then does passive interface gigabit zero zero, and now he won't send advertisements out this interface, um, which obviously saves bandwidth. So we use passive interface to turn off updates out specific interfaces. All right, default routes. Remember, you know we like to create default routes, um, especially um, or sorry, default static routes. So we can actually propagate those out or send them out in RIP updates so that I only have to do it on one router and then the RIP updates will handle passing it out to other routers. And the command is default information originate. So router RIP enter, version 2 enter if you want version 2 space, and then default dash information originate. And now that, that quad zero will be pushed out to other routers. All right, IP6, a little bit different. With IP6, you have to turn on IP6 routing. So first you put on the command IPv6 unicast routing. Then you go into your interface, and then IPv6 rip, um, rip.as, and then enable, and then exit. So with, with IP6, you actually turn rip on on the interfaces themselves. So there's no network statements or anything like that. You go to the specific interface, and you turn rip on. And again with IP6, remember that this information is kept separate from IP4, so show IPv6 protocols or show IPv6 route to see the routing table. Or when you check out the routing table, you can actually be specific and so show IPv6 route RIP, then it'll show you the IPv6 routes you have learned through RIP. Remember, with IPv6, you get a link local address, and if you can, if you also assign an address, each interface will have two IP addresses, um, a private and a public, or, or one that you assigned, and one that's a, a, a local address for that segment. So that's why we typically see two IP addresses for uh, IP6. All right, moving on um, to OSPF. Remember, OSPF stands for Open Shortest Path First. Uh, it's a link state protocol used in inside networks. OSPF uses Dijkstra's method, and so it uses Dijkstra's Shortest Path First algorithm. So basically, what Dijkstra's method does is it calculates the bandwidth on all the routes, and then it gives those each link a cost, and then it figures out the total cost to get to every destination. So in this case, the shortest path for a, for a host that's on R2 to reach the R3 network. So in order for R2 to get over here, uh, where my mouse is, um, the cost is 27. So it's 20, 5, and then 6, 7. So it builds this for the entire network and then gives each destination a cost. And then obviously, anytime it needs to route somewhere, it picks the shortest cost. So with link state protocols, each router learns about each of its own directly connected networks, and then each router says hello to its neighbors, and then each router builds a link state packet with the information that he knows, then he sends it out to his neighbors, and he receives a link state packet from his neighbors, um, and then they, they keep doing this back and forth and learning about more networks. So then they kind of go through this model. So again, the first step is your router learns about what's directly connected, then he makes a link state packet, um, and then he sends out the link state packet, or first he sends out a hello packet to his neighbors, um, and then he builds the link state packet and they send it out. So then um, these link state packets kind of get flooded out the networks, then they start building their tables with all the new information that they learn, and they keep building more routes and they keep putting in the costs. And then finally, this is kind of what they end up with. So now they end up with, you know, in order to go from here to here, the, the shortest path is this, shortest path is this, shortest path is this. Uh, and then that's that way each router has that uh, information in its table. 
So advantages, you know, each router builds its own map of the network to determine the shortest path. Um, you have an immediately flooding of the LSPs, which allows it to converge very fast. Um, obviously, a disadvantage of that would be, you know, the bandwidth it takes. Um, and then after that, you only send out the link state packets when something changes. So they still send out the small, very remember a, a hello packet, very small, um, but we still send those out uh, whatever the default time is for OSPF. I think it's 10 seconds. So those are always sent out so that they know that the other routers are still active, the links are still up. Um, but then if a link goes down for some reason, a new LSP would be for formed and sent out to let everybody know, hey, this route's down. Um, so again, we've already kind of talked about the disadvantages. So ways around some of the disadvantages, obviously with the LSP flooding of the network, so you can, especially when the network first comes on. So one way around that is to have different areas um, where routers update on. So with OSPF, it uses areas. So area zero is the backbone, and every other area is like area one, area 51. So in this case, <laughs> LSPs from area 0 stay in area 0. So they would only go to these four routers here and here because these two routers would also be in area 0. But those two routers would not forward out those packets to these other networks because they're not in area 0. So you can use that to kind of contain the link state updates or yeah, or the link state packets. So only two protocols use OSPF, you know, o, um, Open Shortest Path first and ISIS. ISIS is typically only used at ISPs. Um, we use uh, I OSPF version 2 for our IP4 networks, and we use OSPF version 3 for um, IP6 networks. All right, remember, we can check our routing table with show IP route. Um, and then remember, don't forget, you can do the pipe command to um, separate stuff and say, hey, begin at the gateway. So it gets rid of the uh, legend for us so that we can see how we learned about all these different routes. So in this case, I've got directly connected routes. I've got local routes. I've got um, RIP routes, that kind of thing. So remember, any route that's physically attached to your router is a directly connected route, and he shows up in the routing table um, first. All right, in the routing table, when you're looking at these routes, so basically, you know, I see a letter, uh, an IP address. We'll take, we'll take this one through RIP. So an IP address, some numbers, and then via this number, a number, number. So what that means is the first letter is how it was learned. You know, S is static, C is connected, R is RIP, O is OSPF, and then D is for dual uh, because E was taken by something else. So then the first number that you see is the actual the target network, uh, the network that you know about. So you're like, hey, my router knows about this network that's out there somewhere. Now, this is wrong here. This arrow that points here to 28, that's actually the subnet mass. This arrow should move here to the 120. So the administrative distance of RIP is 120. And then the metric, you know, RIP says, hey, I know in order to get to that network, RIP uses hop count, so the hop count is 2. So I've learned this router through from another router from that is running RIP. I know this network is out there. Uh, I'm, administrative distance is 120, meaning my trust level, and there's t it's two routers away from me. And in order to get there, I send to this guy. This is my next hop address. Uh, this is how long I've known about the route, and then this is my exit interface. So that's how you read the entries in the routing table. Um, don't forget, though, to make sure that you change this. This arrow should not point to the 28. It should point to the 120. And don't forget, connected routes have an administrative distance of 0. Static routes have an uh, administrative distance of 1. Uh, EIGRP is 90. OSPF is 110. And then uh, RIP is 120. And remember, that's the trust level. So if I have a route learned through static, which has an uh, administrative distance of 1, and a route learned through OSPF, uh, which is 110, I'm always going to take the static route over that because it has a lower administrative distance. So EIGRP routes are chosen over OSPF, OSPF routes are chosen over RIP, that kind of thing. All right, and when you get into routing tables, they're made up of a bunch of different, well, several different routes. And they have different names depending on what they are. So typically you'll see something like this. So it'll say 172.16. Now notice there's no letter over here. It just says, hey, I know that there's a bunch of networks at 172.16, blah, blah. And there are five subnets underneath there. Then here they are. So 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, um, that kind of thing. So it'll tell you that there's five different subnets. And out of those five subnets, there's three different subnet masks. So this is a level one route, uh, also called a parent route. So what happens when the routing table is read? Uh, a packet comes in as destined for 192.168, you know, 
So the routing table looks at the level one routes first and skips these other routes. And that way he can go through the routing table faster. And then after he's gone through all the level one routes, he says, oh, wait, wait a minute, okay, this one matched. So then he'll go back. If there's a child route underneath there, he'll then check the child routes. So let's say I got a packet coming in for 172.16.3.50. Um, it would come in, it would check this, 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 and say, hey, this one matched the best. Then it would come back through the child routes and say, hey, um, this was the best match, so I'm going to send it to this interface, um, and I'm going to send it out my hole at serial 000. So the level one routes are read first. If there's a match, then he goes to the child routes, if there, there are any. Now, there's also an ultimate route. An ultimate route is a route that has an exit interface um, or a target IP address. So it has a way out of the router. So a level one route might not be a parent route. So let me give an example. So here's a level one route. This is a parent route. He has child or children underneath him. Here's a level one route that is not a parent route. He has no child. He is an ultimate route because he actually has an exit interface. So yes, it does get confusing. The big thing to know is um, you have level one routes and level two routes. When I read the routing table, I look at the level ones first. If a level one matches, um, after I've gone all the way through, I come back to it, and then if he has children, I check and I see if he's got a better match. If he doesn't have children, um, I just go out to whatever he says. So that's how your routing table is used. So don't forget, ultimate routes are a route that have an exit interface. So in this example here, all of these routes that are highlighted are all ultimate routes because they all have a way out of the router. They all say, hey, I can get out of the router on 0000, or I can get out of the router if I send you here on 0000, or I can get out of the router by sending the 000, that kind of stuff. So an ultimate route is a route that has a way out of the router. Typically, only the level one parent routes are not ultimate routes. Now, again, you won't see that on the CCNA, but it's good to know um, how the routing table is looked up with the layer one, the level one and the level two things. All right, so then they give you an example. So, you know, a network comes in, hey, I'm look, I go through the level one routes, um, that kind of stuff, and then if it's a, a an ultimate route, it has an exit interface. So again, here are the level one parent routes. Remember, a parent route has children underneath it, and it is not an ultimate route. All right, I hope you're really confused on that. Um, but again, the big piece to take away from this is there are level ones and level twos. Level ones are checked first. If there's no match on the level ones, the packet's dropped. If there's a match on the level ones, then I come back and check the level twos. All right, so again, now, the routing lookup process is actually kind of complicated. So basically, um, I go through, and if the best match is a level one ultimate route, I, I send it out that ultimate route. If it's a level one parent route, I go to the next step. I then go check the child routes, and then if there's a match, I send it out. Um, so if there's a match, again, I send it out. But if there's not a match, then I go out to the next step. And then I look for a supernet uh, or stuff like that. Uh, and we'll talk about supernets. A supernet is a, a route summarized that has a, a subnet mask less than the classful. So do you remember in that other example from last week, we had like 172.20 um, with a slash 14. So it's a class B IP address, but it doesn't have the class B subnet mask of slash 16. It has a subnet mask of slash 14. That would be like a, a supernet. And then again, if there's no supernet or anything like that, then the packet's dropped. So make sure you understand when you go through the routing table, it's not the routing table doesn't look for the very first match it finds. It goes through the entire mat routing table of the level ones, and then it finds the one that has the most bits matching. So in this case, you know a packet comes in for 172.16.0.10, um, and there's three different routes in here. Well, this route would match the best, so this is the one that would be picked because this route would match the most bits. All right, it works the same way for IP6. Um, IP6 is kind of classless by design. There are no classes. Um, you know, it uses that uh, that fourth hextet field um, for the, the the different network numbers. So it kind of looks like this. So again, you don't have classes, uh, but again, if I go through and and uh, hey, there's a match, then I kind of take it. So again, notice you don't have level one and level two routes. 
Um, but you know, it's always, hey, um, I've learned this one through EIGRP, and I know about this network that's out there somewhere. EIGRP has administrative distance of 90, it has a, a bandwidth of this. Um, remember that's through the metric. Now, don't worry about this number too much yet. You know, eventually we'll have a chapter where we'll talk about EIGRP and we'll get into how this number is calculated. Um, but then um, I can send it out via this is the next hop, and then this is my exit interface. So just like a, a, a IP4 route. Woo, and that wraps it up. All right, a lot of weird information there. You know, a lot of it you use, and then a lot of it is not really used. You know, it's good to know that the entire routing table is, is checked first, um, and it only has to go through the level one routes, um, because that way you kind of understand that process. But knowing the difference between a supernet and a child route and an ultimate route, and I mean, I have never, ever, other than textbooks and exams, needed to know that material out in the real world. So you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt. All right, so this week in your folder, week nine, um, we checked the materials folder. You got the slides. Now, there's a RIP fact sheet. I don't know if that's going to be helpful for you at all. Uh, it was just some information that I had written down years ago when I learned about RIP. Uh, but then there's the routing table. This is just a document. Again, you can kind of put in your notes. Wait for it. So, you know, a default route um, is typically a quad zero. So it's a static route made up of all zeros. A supernet is a network with a subnet mask less than the classful mask. So it's like a class B where the subnet mask is less than 16. An ultimate route includes one or both. It has a next hop address or an exit interface, a way out of the router. Um, and then a, like a level 1 route, uh, a level 2 route. So again, it kind of shows you that. So this is just something nice to have in your notes. And then there's the routing lookup process. This just kind of maps it out so it flows with you. So the router examines the level one routes. If he's got a best match, he sends it out. Um, if the best match is a parent route, he goes to step two. And then at step two, the router looks at the child routes. If the child route is a match, he forwards out the packet. If not, go to step three. Is the router implementing classful or classless routing behavior? Remember, you can turn on classful behavior. Why you'd ever want to do that, I have no idea. Um, that's why like IP classless is typically a, a command on your router. So if classful routing is in effect, the packet's dropped. If classless behavior is in effect, um, we then look for supernets. Um, and then we go from supernets to default routes. And if nothing matches, then we drop the packet. So this kind of helped me a little bit better than the way the book kind of explained it. All right, so then if we go to your material or your assignments, uh, remember you have a quiz, you have an academy assessment. And then at home, you're supposed to work on the routing table activity and then comparing EIGRP and, and RIP path selection. So you're supposed to do these two at home for practice. No grade, you don't have to bring them into class. But when you come into class, we're going to do Lab 7C. Now, if you guys are coming into the labs and you're not getting things done and it doesn't look like you've either A, read the, the videos or have done any of these practice labs because you're asking me questions, duh, how do I put a host name on a router? Um, I'm going to start making drop boxes for all of these and making these mandatory. Uh, so don't be that guy. All right, guys, um, I'll see you in class for lab day and we'll work on configuring a, a RIP version 2 network.